the title of my sermon is How We Face Change Physically. And I preached this on Sunday, September the 13th, 2020, at the Drive-In Church at Prospect, and then indoors at Trinity and Asbury United Methodist Churches in Harrington, Delaware. My name is the Reverend Dr. Larry Jameson. Dear ones, we stand on the threshold of an accelerated period of innovative and disruptive change. Amazing and unprecedented developments are happening right now in science, technology, finance, education, and in cultural norms. As God's people, we need to ask, how can our families and our congregation hold on to scriptural truth, fellowship, and loyalty to Jesus in the midst of so much change? As Christians, we turn to God, ask for his help, and rest on his promises. Today, I want to talk about how we face change physically. Well, dear ones, we need to be as healthy as we can possibly be in order to live for Jesus and face the multiple changes of the 21st century. God wants you to be physically well, so you can do more good things. Now, we know this because of what Jesus said in John 10.10. 10. Jesus said, I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, end quote. So Jesus is our healer. And he makes blind people see again, deaf people hear, and disabled people walk. And every time we do something to protect our health and to protect the health of others, we are partnering with, partnering with Jesus Christ. That is a wonderful privilege. And that is our motivation. And it's a good one. Now, we've all heard that old proverb by Benjamin Franklin that says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we know that practicing habits that promote good health are priceless. And when we can avoid getting sick, well, we know we're doing something important. Did you know that the CDC tells us that up to 40% of the deaths that occur every year in the United States are preventable? So what practical things can we do to improve our health? Well, I have a couple of suggestions for you. First, we can prayerfully and passionately educate all of our young people that smoking tobacco is a terrible idea. You know, smoking is the number one cause of preventable illness and death in the United States and worldwide. So we need to ask the question, is smoking a sin? No, I don't think it is a sin. It's incredibly harmful, but it's not a sin. Are non-smokers better than smokers? No. You know, <laughs> religious people can get sort of wacko about tobacco. Let me tell you a story. This is a true story. It happened to me. When I was a preteen, I attended the Temple City Church of the Nazarene. And one Sunday, my sister uh, came to the church. Now, that in itself was a minor miracle that she would actually come to church. And somebody had heard that she loved to sing. And so they recruited her on the spot right there into the choir that Sunday. Well, that was a second miracle, really. <laughs> and it just so happened that there was choir practice during Sunday school, and they put my sister in a choir robe, and that was amazing. And wow, we were really we were really excited. My family was really excited about seeing my sister up there in the choir. Okay, so after practice and before worship, my sister uh, decides to take a break. She lights up a cigarette in the women's restroom. No big deal, right? I mean, it is the 1970s. Oh, you would have thought a disaster had taken place. I look around and where's my sister? She's gone, poof. The preacher's wife caught my sister smoking in the bathroom and kicked her out of the choir on the spot. Wow. Talk about an overreaction. My sister never came back to that church or any church ever again. Now, that was exactly the opposite of what a church should do. You know, if people smoke, we should pray for them. We should encourage people to quit but not treat them like lepers. You know, this was a big lesson for me as a young person, because for the first time, I saw that sometimes religious convictions can 
backfire and do more damage than, the, than good. And so, dear ones, I'm praying that none of you smoke, but if you do, <laughs> I'm going to do my best not to be a jerk about it. Oh God, please protect us from preventable disease and uptight religious attitudes. Okay, here's the second thing. And this is something I've never talked about in, in the pulpit before. You have all seen that I've lost 28 pounds over the last year. And you might wonder, well, what's my secret? Well, it's intermittent fasting. You know, people think this is hard, but if you do it right, it's not hard. I want you to know that everybody fasts every day. Isn't that interesting? You might wonder if that is true. Well, it is true. Do you eat when you sleep? No, of course not. That's impossible. Do you sleep every day? Yes, we all do. Well, what do we call the very first meal of the day? Breakfast. That's when we break the fast. Now, everyone in the world fasts every day. Now, right there, we have already made fasting a normal part of everyday life. So it's normal for you and it's normal for me. Now, why did I get into inter intermittent fasting? Well, about a year ago, I had some pre-diabetes problems. So we started doing research. We wanted to know if there was anything scientifically evidence-based that was proven safe and effective to improve our health that didn't involve taking drugs. Turns out, there is. We found some books that inspired us to try something new. We found Jason Fung and Jen Stevens. Oh, I recommend these books to you. Now, one of the most important things that I learned from our research is the key role that hormones play in metabolic regulation. You know, God created this sine wave, the sine wave nature of things. Like there's day and night, wake and sleep, the circadian rhythms. Uh, homeostasis is, is a wonderful concept. And did you know that insulin resistance is really a form of homeostasis? It's just the body pushing back on too much insulin. You know, there are regulatory and counter-regulatory hormones. There's hot and cold, work and rest, women and men, moms and dads, yin and yang. Oh my goodness, that's like an endless number of features for this concept. You know, in Ecclesiastes 3.1, the Bible says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, end quote. So God is the one who gave us regulatory and counter-regulatory hormones that control not only our weight, but every metabolic system in our bodies. And so, now this is important. When we extend our daily fast, even a little bit, we extend the ability of our counter-regulatory hormones to make repairs to our bodies. Now, one of the primary regulatory hormones is insulin. And some of the counter-regulatory hormones are glucagon, epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, and HGH, which is human growth hormone. You know, there's also a couple of key hunger hormones that uh, leptin and ghrelin, and they counter-regulate each other. So, when we eat, the regulatory hormone insulin is large and in charge, and it's busy storing away fat. And when we fast, the counter-regulatory hormones, they step up and they do their thing. They make repairs. And the, pair, the repairs they usually make happen only at night, because that usually that's the only time that we're in a fasted state. But if you continue uh, that, that fasted state just a little bit longer, oh, all kind of things, wonderful things start taking place. Autophagy replaces damaged cells. Human growth hormone starts building muscle and bone. Stored fat gets burned. Stem cells start, start rebuilding damaged organs, and the immune system gets a reboot. Now, if you've ever had um, pets, you know that animals fast instinctively. 
they don't have to think it through. This is just part of their routine. And so when a dog or a cat gets sick, they go off their food. Why? It's because fasting accelerates healing. Now, this has been scientifically proven to be true. The greatest thing about this is that fasting is free. It costs nothing to fast. Nobody can copyright fasting. Nobody can sell it to you. You know, <laughs> that's a beautiful gift from God. Like anything else, you need to start small and get your sea legs with this. You know, it's, there's more to it than just a little bit. And, and it's easy to start making uh, rookie mistakes if, if you don't know what you're doing. You need to read and you need to, to go about it slowly. You know, Sue and I have been learning about fasting for over a year and we've been building up slowly to where we are. And we are so very happy about what God has done for us in this area. Now, dear ones, when we turn to God and we ask for his help, and rest on his promises, God answers prayer. Sue and I know this because he has answered our prayers. I'd like to say a prayer for you. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your healing power and your mercy and your forgiveness and your love for all the people of Prospect, Trinity, and Asbury churches and all the people in our community. Lord, we know that you have healed so many people, so please heal us too. Show us how to embrace habits and behaviors that enhance our physical health. And Lord, please save us from uptight religious attitudes because we're all sinners. We're all on a journey and we all desperately need your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to my sermon.